Our next speaker is Lim Lee Ching from Third World Network, and I'm looking for Ching. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks, Ching. <coughs> Thank you very much, and thank you, Brian. Um, uh, it's a really an honor to be able to present the result of our analysis. My colleague and I, uh, Li Lin, um, looked at the legal and regulatory issues uh, surrounding gene drives. Um, we started really with the objective of reviewing the relevant international and other legal and regulatory instruments and processes that are relevant to gene drives and gene drive organisms. And we wanted to identify uh, what is the gap in the current international regulatory system. In particular, we looked at the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, which is a near universal treaty uh, dealing with uh, the impacts on biodiversity and its protocols. And um, of course, then we also wanted to propose what we thought would be uh, needed for a precautionary legal and regulatory biosafety regime that would be specific to gene drive organisms. And indeed, there are regulatory challenges related to GDOs, as I would call them, and they pose specific risks. We heard already uh, this morning uh, about their propensity to spread uh, often uh, across national borders, as well as the uh, potential irreversibility, uh, the persistence. These are the very characteristics that actually make uh, it attractive uh, to develop gene drive organisms, that those same characteristics actually pose complex legal and regulatory issues. Um, it's clear actually that gene drive organisms are genetically modified organisms. Uh, that's a very clear under current definitions in most uh, legal systems today. So therefore they are regulated under biosafety laws. However, the current laws are not fully equipped to address the specific challenges that are raised by gene drive organisms. They were drafted really with conventional GMOs in mind. Uh, as we know, largely applied to cultivated systems, for example, in the case of GM crops, uh, that uh, where the intention has always been to prevent spread. Uh, and here we have a completely different situation with gene drive organisms, where you want them to spread and persist in the wild environment. So what we do need are fit-for-purpose regulation of gene drive organisms that build on existing biosafety regulations. We also think that legally binding rules are necessary. While in principle, you, we would welcome uh, guidelines uh, that have been proposed by researchers, for example, and that has been the case with gene drive uh, developers. Um, some papers were mentioned earlier where the researchers and developers have ex actually said, this is what we need to do uh, to govern uh, uh, this. But I would put it to you that uh, while this uh, is welcome, um, self-regulation is actually not uh, sufficient. Uh, the consequences that we are talking about in terms of potential impacts on the environment, for example, are on a public good. And it's not sufficient to le leave it in the hands of private actors. Uh, and I think you know one of the clearest uh, examples where self-regulation has actually failed is the recent case of the uh, genome edited uh, twins that were born in China recently. And we have the WHO, for example, uh, as the international organization responsible for public health, uh, putting in place after the fact uh, committees to advise it on the oversight and governance of these issues. And I think with gene drive organisms, we don't want to be in that situation. We need to anticipate uh, what could happen uh, we need to govern and think about what are the maximal, maximum impacts and implications for this technology and be prepared to regulate it. So we need to start this discussion now. Uh, and of course, uh, the rules have to be international in nature, uh, you know, uh, by the very nature of gene drive organisms being able to spread in a transboundary manner. We do need to have uh, an international discussion, consensus and negotiation on, on these issues. Um, I'm not going to go through, and I don't expect you to read the tables, uh, but just to just show you uh, what we did, uh, we looked at about 10 uh, instruments that we thought were particularly relevant to gene drive organisms, uh, particularly the Convention on Biological Diversity and its two protocols, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress. Now, the Convention on Biological Diversity is a near universal treaty. Uh, only one party, in, uh, one country in the world is not a party, and that's the United States. Um, but it's a treaty that's aimed at the protection of biological diversity. 
Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, under the CBD and its protocols, the definition of genetically modified organisms or li living modified organisms uh, apply to gene drive organisms. So GDOs are already uh, the subject matter of these treaties. And they have already started substantive work on these issues. We looked also at another cluster of agreements uh, which are uh, related to the WTO, the Agreement on Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures, uh, the International Plant Protection Convention, and the World Organization for Animal Health Standards, um, which is really to, to look at, because these are important for WTO members. But then we realized that actually, at the moment, they are of limited relevance to gene-derived organisms, uh, because none at the moment are in currently in international trade. But this could um, become more important as, as time goes on, we'll see. We looked also at the uh, Biological Weapons Convention and the Environmental Modification Convention. Uh, these two treaties prevent the hostile and military use uh, of biological uh, materials. And of course, under international law, uh, this is uh, prohibited um, to stockpile, use and develop uh, biological materials for uh, you know, uh, hostile purposes. Um, and we've heard already this morning about the potential for the use of gene drive organisms uh, um, you know, for such purposes and the dual use nature of such technologies. So we felt was, this is an important aspect that needed to be addressed. Um, we looked also at the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, this has become increasingly important because as uh, Christopher showed in his last slide, uh, the last decision of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the issue of free prior and informed consent has become very, uh, has taken prime place uh, because if gene drive organisms are released into the lands and territories of indigenous peoples or affect uh, their activities and livelihoods, then how do you go about these? And there are norms and standards set uh, by this international declaration. While it's not legally binding, it's been endorsed by 150 members of the UN General Assembly. Uh, and the final uh, thing we look at was the guidance framework for testing of GM mosquitoes. This was published by the WHO and the Foundations for the National Institutes of Health. Um, they look at the issue of testing of GM mosquitoes. Uh, this is often raised as a, a sort of standard uh, by gene drive researchers, especially those working on the uh, gene drive mosquitoes. Uh, but just to point out that this was not a process that was developed intergovernmentally, and in our analysis, actually, we do find that there are flaws in its approach uh, to gene drive mosquitoes. Um, another area that we looked at uh, quite closely was this whole uh, issue of the regulation of contained use. Because currently, there are no gene drive organisms released into the environment yet, but they are in research, in laboratories, and in contained use. And as we heard uh, earlier, I think from Kevin, and he said that you know even a small release uh, could have the potential, uh, if there was an accidental escape, of having widespread uh, uh, consequences, right? Um, and the risk of accidental escape, let's face it, uh, even from uh, you know, what you think of as traditional laboratory biosafety, uh, is high. This has happened. There are numerous incidences, for example, the accidental distribution of pandemic influenza viruses from labs that are regarded as highly secure and professional. This was from US CDC, Centers for Disease Controls. We've had improperly stored viable smallpox uh, vials uh, at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. We've had uh, accidental distribution of anthrax bacteria by US military uh, labs, the Dugway Proving Ground. So these are not hypothetical risks in that sense that we can learn from the pathogens uh, debate and discussions that have been happening there and apply them to gene drive organisms. Now, internationally, uh, if uh, a GMO is destined for contained use. They do fall under the provisions of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, but uh, it, it's very much uh, uh, premised on national standards. Okay, So the importance of national contained use standards are very uh, paramount, uh, and we feel that you know we need to take a better look at this issue, because that's where the research and development is happening, firstly, and there are no international contained use standards, uh, well, for, for GMOs, or lab biosafety, actually, and they are non-specific to the risks of gene drive organisms, and we think that this is a big gap that needs to be addressed. We did look at uh, some regional standards, for example, the EU directive on the contained use of GM microorganisms, 
and the so-called uh, manuals and guidelines that are put up by the WHO, the um, US Department um, of Human he Health and Human Services, as well as the uh, NIH guidelines on research with recombinant and synthetic uh, nucleic acids. Uh, and these actually provide us some salient criteria by which we can start to develop uh, the regulations that are applicable to the contained use of GDOs. And I'll talk about, about this in a later stage. So when, when we took the step back and said, look, we've done this review, and we can see there are existing international instruments that are relevant, and they relate to various aspects of gene drive or governance, sometimes very specifically, for example, uh, if it's uh, in relation to dual use, but there are gaps in relation to their coverage. None of these cover gene drive organisms comprehensively, and neither are they quite equipped for purpose to address some of the specific challenges, like transboundary movement, for example, uh, in terms of GDOs. In our assessment, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity and its protocols currently offer the most comprehensive international structure. Uh, as I mentioned previously, GDOs are already in their scope, and they have begun substantive work on this issue, and this work is continuing even as we speak. Uh, next week, there will be an ad hoc technical expert group meeting uh, on synthetic biology, which will consider the issue of gene drive. So this international discussion is happening at the moment. But there are still limitations that urgently need to be addressed. And at the same time, we need to also continue work in other foreign specific issues. For example, the issue of bioweapons, uh, potential hostile military use, or what do we do when we talk about free prior and informed consent? Uh, where do we go to look for examples uh, of how do we do this? Okay. Um, so now I want to turn really uh, to the more, I guess, the meat of the presentation to say, okay, so we thought about this, we see the gaps. What are the key elements do we think are necessary for legal and regulatory regime for gene drive organisms, especially if we uh, frame them within the convention and its protocols? Um, and, and first, I wanted to, to say that you know we looked really at uh, these two principles uh, to underpin any legal framework, which would be the precautionary principle and the polluter pays principle. I mean, a lot has been said already about the precautionary principle. Uh, in terms of guiding environmental decision-making under conditions of scientific uncertainty. Uh, and the polluter pays principle uh, places responsibility on those producing the pollution to pay for damage to the environment or human health. Now, this is very closely linked, of course, to the issue of liability and redress. So where there's a grievance, this is a principle in law, right? Where there's a grievance, there must be a remedy. Uh, these principles are you know, reaffirmed in the Rio Declaration of Environment and Development. They are lofty principles. They're there. They're actually operationalized uh, in the CBD and its protocols. Really, the purpose is to avoid harm, to be able to take anticipatory action, and to provide justice to victims of harm. So what are the elements we think are absolutely necessary? These are minimum elements, and they, they're not exhaustive, but we feel at least these are fundamental uh, points that need to be taken up by the international community. Uh, firstly, that there must be strict contained use standards specific to gene drive organisms. As I mentioned, there is nothing uh, internationally existing at the moment. And at the moment, it is, there are no standardized application of the national contained use standards. So a lot of it is actually left to individual researchers and institutions to decide, for example, what kind of uh, safety level or confinement level that you put uh, on the experiments that are currently uh, carrying out. Uh, for example, through freedom of information requests, a colleague of mine discovered that uh, a population suppression drive for New World Screwum uh, being funded by the U.S. D uh, Department of Agriculture is happening in Panama, uh, where there is at least one endemic species uh, of screw in Panama. So, I mean, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, you try not to do gene drive experiments in areas where there are species, the target species uh, occurring, doesn't seem to have, you know, fit, factored in here. And they were carried, doing these experiments in what is uh, known as biosafety level two, laboratories. Our contention is that if you have gene drive organisms which have a propensity to spread or are designed to eradicate populations, for example, or introduce deleterious or lethal traits, then you do have to have higher containment uh, stringency. And this is the case with pathogens. 
if your pathogen is infectious, if it, uh, you know, if it's lethal, if it cannot be removed easily from the environment, then you have BSL three or four, so higher standards of containment. And we can make the argument that there are parallels with some some gene drive organisms at least, because they can uh, spread or they can be infectious in terms of when they mate, when these organisms mate, they may have lethal traits, you know, suppressing, eradicating a population, and they're difficult to remove from the environment. So it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a logical uh, step that we need to take. Um, and at the national level, so while we don't have these international rules in place uh, yet, and we feel that this is an urgent gap that needs to be addressed, uh, at the national level, uh, Governments could already take steps, for example, to require licensing of experiments with gene drive organisms in contained use. And this would allow for appropriate oversight. I think it was Kevin that mentioned earlier in the session that you know, he, he would like to call for a registry, actually, uh, of all gene drive experiments uh, that, that are being planned and conducted, and, and that's a good first step. But I mean, we would go further and say, well, then you have to get approval from your national authorities before you start any uh, experiments to say that, yes, I'm going to work with this, what kind of level of containment am I going to use, et cetera, et cetera. And this would allow for oversight. Um, the other key issue when it comes to gene drive organisms is the issue of what we call joint decision making. We know there's a high likelihood of transboundary movement with GDOs. This may be intentional, for example, in the case of the gene drive uh, mosquitoes. You know, uh, the idea is at least either regionally or continent-wide, you want the, you know, them to be released uh, across boundaries, right? Across national boundaries. But also because of the, uh, you can't, you know, confine, uh, you know, a species uh, if it occurs across borders and you can't say, no, you can't cross the border, you need your passport, for example, or show me your, your approval papers, right? This is biology, this will happen. Uh, so what we are saying is that every country should actually have a right to give or withhold approval uh, for a GDO release in another jurisdiction that could directly or indirectly impact its territory. Uh, and we have a, a system under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety of prior informed consent. This is already required before the first intentional transboundary movement of GMOs were released into the environment. But this is carried out largely on a bilateral basis. So for example, if um, uh, Brazil, a party to the protocol, wants to export a GMO into my country, Malaysia, it would have to seek the consent of my country before it's allowed to export it. Yeah. Uh, but this is on a bilateral basis. Now we are talking, and this was what the Cartagena Protocol uh, was set up and how it operates. Here, with gene drive organisms, we are talking about the possibility of uh, spread to new different countries, multiple countries. So the international community actually needs to talk about what are the modalities that we need to have in place to, take, to get the consent of a wider number of countries when should we get the consent? Who do we get the consent from? None of these international governance arrangements are in place yet. There is nothing under the Cartagena Protocol, uh, which probably is, you know, it's, it's the, at the, the stage in best place to look at these issues, but there is nothing uh, discussed yet. We haven't even started discussing this yet at the international level. And then we need to think about when and where consent is exercised. Because if you talk, for example, about a domestic release, for example, let's take Burkina Faso as an example, you know, if, uh, for, for gene drive mosquitoes. Um, and a release in what that one country could potentially affect neighboring countries in the region, at least at the regional level, right? So when do you seek consent of other countries? Is it after you've done the release or before? the point of release. And we feel that it's important that these processes happen in advance of any release. Um, we need effective measures for dealing with unintentional transboundary movements because GDOs are amenable to such movements, whether from contained use or from domestic release. There are procedures under the Cartagena Protocol that deal with this, but they are limited at the moment. Uh, there are procedures that say that, oh, you have to notify the potentially affected country, you you have to provide information, you have to consult, you have to decide on what emergency measures to take, for example. They're all necessary steps, but they need to be strengthened when it comes to GDOs. Yeah? Um, I won't say much more about this because this has already been brought up. Uh, you know, we think that 
we need to have genuine public participation. There are procedures under the Cartagena Protocol. It's mandatory uh, for parties to uh, involve um, the, um, the citizens in decision making, consultation, decision making, participation. Uh, and we have examples like the Aarhus Convention, for example, which places access to information, participation in decision making, and access to justice as central pillars. I think the issue here then is about operationalization and implementation. We have these nice lofty ideals uh, in many laws, uh, but the reality is that participation doesn't always happen. Maybe it happens in some uh, developed countries, I don't, I don't know. But in my country, in, in some other countries, this has not been the case. And we need to be able to, to operationalize this. Um, as mentioned by Christopher earlier, the CBD parties in 2018 actually preconditioned uh, the issue of prior informed consent before any introduction into the environment of gene drive organisms. There are no international guidelines yet on how do we deal with this. I mean, this is a big issue. It's not an easy issue. Uh, but what I think is clear, at least um, from, the, from the decision, is that there shouldn't be any a priori assumption of consent. Um, you know, and to say that, oh, well, maybe we can have a model where we just opt out. No, I think that's not, that was not the intention. Uh, when this decision was adopted, it was quite clear that said that, look, you have to be able to get free prior and informed consent. And the, what, what do we mean by free? Without coercion? Prior? How far in advance? How do you take into account indigenous people's time frames are very different from our own? Yeah? Intergenerational? Uh, you know, these aspects are important to Indigenous people. Um, all these issues, th there is still no clarity on this. There are norms and standards uh, which are set by the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, for example. Uh, and there is, under the CBD, the Mo'ots could style voluntary guidelines on, the, uh, on obtaining free prior and informed consent in relation to access of and benefit sharing of traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples. So there are examples that we can uh, learn from. And we know, for example, uh, that in the exercise of, of these rights, it's not been easy. There has been um, uh, uh, developments uh, in the issue of free prior informed consent in the extractive industries, for example, where indigenous peoples are at the forefront fighting for their lands and territories. So there are things that we can draw on. But are these easy issues? No, they're complex. Are they quick issues to resolve? No, this is going to take time. But if we're going to address this issue seriously, we need to take the time to be able to do this. Um, I think people talked about risk assessment and risk management approaches. I don't, I'm running slowly out of time, or quickly out of time rather. Um, but just to say that this has already been recognized by parties to the CBD and the Cartagena Protocol. They said, yeah, we may need to consider are our traditional approaches to risk assessment sufficient for gene drive organisms? Uh, what happens when you have a small field release? I mean, some people talk about even the release of a, a few organisms may result in widespread release. The technical expert group that advises the CBD on these issues said that we need to recognize that with gene drives, a release to environment may be irreversible. And that you know, proposals have been made, for example, to test gene drive organisms in islands. But islands are not fully contained uh, eco uh, eco ecological environments. And this was recognized by the technical experts. We need to, I think, have, I mean, this has been mentioned time, a few times already, humility. What are the data limitations? Are we actually able to do risk assessment for gene drive organisms? Are we, able, are we brave enough to say that we can? And what do we do? when we can't, when we don't have the data uh, to do this. Now, there are processes happening at the international level. In 2020, parties to the Cartagena Protocol will consider whether additional guidance material on risk assessment is needed for gene drive organisms. And we feel that, yes, this is a process that has to take place, that has to take into account all these issues, but also must be honest in terms of how far we can go in terms of risk assessment. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, you know, to, if release were to happen, that would actually preempt all these discussions. They will be moot, right? So we need to, to, to have these processes in place and to take the time to look at it seriously. Um, I will very quickly run through full assessment of socioeconomic impacts. Parties under the Cartagena Protocol have the right to take into account socioeconomic considerations. However, this is a very weak provision. It is not well implemented and it doesn't amount to requiring or conducting socioeconomic impact assessments. 
you know, Helen brought up many issues uh, in terms of wider issues that we need to discuss. How do we assess all this, uh, the ethical issues that Christopher talked about? How do we really take this into account uh, um, in decision making on gene drive organisms? Let me tell you, while this is an issue for GMOs, uh, we are still struggling with the implementation. There is guidance, international guidance available, but we are just at the start of this process. So things still have to happen. Um, just very briefly to say that neither risk assessment alone nor one that is supplemented by you know, taking socioeconomic considerations into account uh, is going to be sufficient. Uh, I think uh, quite a few people have said this, that maybe we need to take a broader approach, a technology assessment approach perhaps, and by this, I don't just mean evaluating uh, the attributes of a single technology, but really what we're doing is assessing a technology in relation to various options and alternatives to address the same problem. That is a broad approach to technology assessment. And that needs, of course, broad public participation in the inputs, to broaden out the inputs, as well as the outputs and the policy options uh, for decision makers. Um, rigorous monitoring and detection, I mean, this is absolutely necessary for gene drive organisms uh, because once they're released, they can't be uh, withdrawn in a biological sense. We need to be able to track the movements, to, to look at the spread uh, through populations and across borders and ecosystems to identify unintended effects, etc. And then, you know, I, I wish I could be as confident that, you know, maybe we do have the detection methods, uh, as Kevin mentioned earlier in, in the panel discussion, that we are able to detect them. But then, of course, who holds the detection methods? Where are the power imbalances? Do we have access to these detection methods? Who's going to help us monitor um, where, for how long, uh, you know, how far? I mean, very important questions that we still have yet to grapple with. And let's face it, even with genetically modified organisms, we're not doing an adequate enough job. Uh, maybe in Europe you are, <laughs> I don't know. But in many other countries, this is not happening really. A lot of it is left to the developers just to put a report in every you know, year or so. Nobody's looking at what's actually happening in the ecosystem out there. Uh, and finally, uh, the final sort of plank that we thought was very important was that we need stringent liability and redress rules. And the minimum requirement for gene drive organisms would be an international civil liability regime with a strict liability standard. This was what actually developing countries fought very hard for in the negotiations of the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress. This is an international treaty that has just entered into force. It is uh, about 46 parties at the moment, maybe more uh, will go um, or will join us as time goes on. But it has its limitations, uh, so it's not ideal either. And we really don't know how to, to deal. Uh, they've not been implemented and applied for GMOs uh, as such yet. Uh, so we need to, to ensure uh, that we, we um, require financial security, for example, because that's not mandatory currently under the supplementary protocol. But we need to ensure that there, if there is harm, then there's ability and means to be able to compensate for that harm. And national civil liabilities laws are going to be more important most countries at the moment actually don't even have biosafety laws, much less national civil liability laws or national liability laws for biosafety. Uh, so still work in progress. I think you've heard me say this many times, we need the time and space and this is you know, still things that are, are happening. So what we're actually saying, I think at the end of the day is that you know, before we even think about whether we should be releasing gene drive organisms into the environment, we need to have these rules in place. Uh, binding on all countries in international so that it's uh, applicable to all countries. Now we have a decision from the parties to the protocol, uh, sorry, from the CBD parties, uh, as mentioned, the 2018 decision. It's a good start. It places precautionary obligations on parties to comply with. Uh, and not just that, I think uh, even non-parties, the USA, for example, and any would-be uh, gene drive developers should look at this and, and say, yeah, we will adhere to this in good faith because this is actually the will of the international communities. Not, this is not an unregulated space that can be experimented with at will. Okay? Parties, international governments have agreed this, they have said something about this. Now, uh, Christopher mentioned and he showed you the text of that decision where he talked about risk assessment, risk management and free prior and informed consent. But when you look closely at the decision, it's interlinked to previous decisions of the parties. And we see some, some good 
things in there which parties had said. They said, look, for example, you need to consider extraterritorial impacts, particularly relevant for gene drive organisms when there are transboundary implications. You need to ensure that there is public participation of indigenous peoples and local communities. If it's if you're talking about anything agriculture, you need to talk, look at food security issues. You need to consider socio-economic cultural impacts. Um, you need to examine liability and redress. So actually, there is a whole body of decisions that have been taken by parties uh, to the CBD already, uh, you know, for several years that say, look, we are concerned about this, yeah? But we need the time to deliberate, uh, to understand what these the implications are and to put in place uh, the adequate procedures and processes to address these conditions. Um, I'm going to say um, that, you know, this is, I mean, you've heard this term, you know, moratorium, and some of these people are so scared and say, oh my God, you know, we're going to stop the technology. This is going to, you know, and, and Helen talked about this. And when we put it ourselves in the context of what are you doing if you don't uh, save 435,000 uh, lives uh, from malaria and, and you stop this technology, where's the responsibility? Now, I think we need to really uh, look at this and say, look, if we don't get the regulatory issues right, if we don't put the right procedures and governance in place, uh, then, and we get it wrong, that's actually going to be more time consuming, more politically challenging and more costly. Um, uh, and there's precedence uh, in the international community. The CBD parties, for example, have ad adopted uh, on at least three occasions um, a moratorium or you know, we can say, well, let's have a pause. Let's consider fully what the full implications are on ge genetic use restriction technologies that prevent uh, farmers from uh, saving and replanting seeds because they would not germinate. That was uh, really uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, something that the FAO and the International Treaty, the Commission on Genetic Resources say, hey, no, developing country farmers uh, need this. You can't do this. So we took a pause with that um, in relation to climate-related uh, geoengineering. Uh, the party said, well, let's not do any large-scale experimentation until we know what the full consequences of what we are proposing here uh, is on the, on the climate. Uh, ocean fertilization as well. Uh, party suited CBD said, look, we don't know what the implications of this are. We don't want to have any large-scale experimentation. We, uh, there should be no commercialization of such technologies. Um, so we think really that the time is now to really take that step back to give the time and space to put in place the right kind of governance, the right kind of regulations, to have the kind of public engagement um, that Helen talked about, genuine public participation, genuine public debate. And this is one um, of the main aims of this symposium as well, as to start and kick off this discussion. So we think these are the critical step forwards that there should be no intentional releases into the environment, including field trials of any gene drive organism at, in, the, in the meantime that there has to be immediately strict contained use standards applied to existing research and development in the lab, as well as uh, in relation to transport. That monitoring and detection has to happen already uh, in terms of unintentional releases and unintentional transboundary movements. Um, we need to look at procedures, for example, and there are uh, possibly procedures under the CBD that can uh, you know, do this kind of registry to understand where the experiments are happening, what kind of research is going on, uh, a collective uh, effort and that we need international rules for this constraint period, including for its enforcement and liability and redress, uh, they have to be effectively operational. And then only when we take this time and space out to have this kind of discussion and to put in place the right conditions, then you know, we, can, we can move forward, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you.